Hello, my name is Graham Curry, and I'm here to talk to you about global light rail and tram developments. This presentation is a global review of practices in light rail, highlighting best practice developments. Its purpose really is to help uh, Korea uh, come up with uh, good designs for light rail systems. I'm going to talk about United States light rail developments. I chair the Light Rail Transit Co Systems Committee at the US Transportation Research Board. I'm also an Australian and I uh, am a professor of public transport in Melbourne, Australia. So I'm going to talk about Australian light rail development. Uh, and Melbourne, uh, where I'm based, has the largest light rail system in the world. Uh, but both, uh, both these experiences uh, tell us that the French movement in light rail, which we call the Nouveau Tramway movement, is a very important lesson, which I think uh, Korea should uh, take a look of. So I'm going to spend some time on that. And then I'm going to talk about new developments in light rail. So the United States. <clears throat> well, um, not, not a country known for light rail, but in fact, there's quite a lot of these systems and they've been developing particularly over the last 30 odd years. Uh, here's a picture of two of them. Uh, on, the, on the right, we have a streetcar. Uh, the Americans use this term streetcar. It means using light rail vehicles in mixed traffic environments. It tends to make them slow and unreliable, but it is good for penetration. And on the left there, we have one of the metro systems in uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. And we have larger cars in America, a typical design. Um, but light rail tends to operate in lots of environments, including uh, off street in uh, segregated rights of way. As early as 1984, there weren't a lot of light rail or even streetcar systems. This diagram shows the size of the system by the size of the sign. Stars are streetcars and uh, circles are the light rail systems. And at this time in the mid 80s, San Diego was the largest new generation system, followed by Boston. Boston's a legacy system. I'm going to use that word a lot because some of these light rail and streetcar systems have been there for you know, nearly 100 years. And um, this diagram shows San Francisco, the, uh, the cable streetcar, and also New Orleans, one of the older systems. Well, by um, the last 30 years, this is what's happened in the United States. There's been a bit of a quiet revolution with large scale systems being developed in Dallas, uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles will grow a lot into the future. Denver, Salt Lake, um, Portland, Oregon is another great place. Um, and a lot of streetcars have been developed as well. These are the types of cars we have in the United States. Lots of different types of environments. As a general rule, the United States cars, uh, streetcars and uh, light rail vehicles tend to be large and heavy. So they're heavier light rail. This is partly to do with their context, which is they have uh, a lot of these vehicles running on tracks with big heavy trains. And, and the designs are somewhat of a safety uh, um, reaction if you like but I'm going to say that that is changing and there we have different systems from different cities I'll put two pictures from Los Angeles because because of recent developments this city which is known for the car is really transforming itself and will be the one of the largest developments in light rail in the next 20 30 years because they have a lot of funding to increase the systems Australia <clears throat> well an interesting fact about Australia is um, around about the middle of the century, uh, the 20th, uh, 21st century, um, the um, 1945 uh, trams actually were the biggest form of transport in Australia. 70% uh, of all passenger kilometres uh, travelled were by public transport and 53% of those were by tram. Over a billion tram trips a year, but as happened around the world, these systems were withdrawn, um, except for Melbourne. Melbourne, Australia is the largest trans system in the world. It has 500 uh, light rail vehicles, uh, but it's also a legacy streetcar because the system is over 100 years old. And while it dominates Australia and possibly the world, I'm afraid it's quite unreliable because of its old age. This diagram shows the amount of track that is mixed traffic in around cities in the world. And Melbourne is far in excess of any scale. And you see some photographs there of what that means. It makes these vehicles very unreliable to run within mixed traffic and slow. Uh, as this diagram shows, this is from the UITP, International Association of Public Transport. It shows all of the different light rail speeds around the world. 
And there is Melbourne down the lowest 25th, uh, 20th percentile because of the streetcar operation. But I'm glad to say Melbourne is coming out of that. And our struggle with light rail systems in Melbourne is one of modernisation. And really, we've been buying brand new cars. We have lots of orders for these new light rail vehicles of a very European design. And we've been doing a lot of work on placemaking around tram stops because trams and light rail vehicles have a great way, great means of changing urban development to be very attractive, to improve lifestyle quality. And you see some examples there. And we've also been slowly segregating the right of way from traffic to make them more reliable. The rest of Australia, Adelaide has a small system with some elements of European design. Sydney's the new system. Uh, our biggest street in Australia, uh, George Street, is now dominated by light rail vehicles. Gold Coast has a very high tourism market and trams are very attractive to tourism. Go uh, Canberra as well is a new system just being developed uh, in operation now. Uh, it's a very low density city, uh, Canberra, but it, the light rail has been able to help concentrate development. Just some data from papers I've written about all of this. Right of way segregation. Uh, Melbourne has mostly mixed traffic, but the other systems are mostly uh, segregated out of traffic and more reliable, um, as the average speed data there shows. And uh, stop spacing as well, in particularly the newer system, Sydney, uh, is more European standard. And you can really get these vehicles to perform better if they have wide stop spacing. Melbourne has historical stop spacing, much like buses. And we're trying to actually get rid of some stops to speed the system up. A bit of a history here from the United States and Australia of light rail development, uh, contemporary. Uh, both the systems of ridership is booming. In fact, some of the highest ridership growth in the United States in transit is in light railways. But for different reasons, in, in um, the United States, the middle graphic uh, shows the amount of service being provided. And the United States is really being investing in lots of service level uh, high frequency services, not as much as Australia. And this tends to, to boom ridership. But if you look at the last graphic, just ridership per kilometre operated, uh, Australian systems are far more uh, cost effective, far more um, efficient, if you like, at doing that. And part of that is that we have commercial operations. Uh, we contract out the operation of services to the private sector. Uh, we subsidise them, much in the same way as the public sector. Uh, but we feel that we get um, better operations out of that. And, and in the United States, they haven't, and they have public operation. And they, they are really pumping in service. Um, what about ridership? Well, this is an interesting graphic. Australia, we get about 430,000-odd uh, riders per route kilometre of service. The United States is high, higher than we are, uh, 582. But that's largely because they pump in a lot of service which can be per, per vehicle not as effective. But the standout is Europe. Europe is way ahead uh, of light rail systems in terms of ridership of everywhere else. Indeed, I did a study about what affects light rail ridership around the world. And uh, this uh, is all available online. And we found that the biggest single drivers of light rail ridership around the world were the service level, the frequency of service. Um, and this is a true of all transit. So what you really want is short headways of your, your trams. Um, the second biggest driver of ridership around the world was just being in Europe. There's some kind of European factor, which I'm going to talk about next, which is affecting ridership on light railways. Speed's interesting. Speed is actually a negative effect on light rail ridership. Why? Because we have higher ridership in inner areas where there's lots of employment, lots of commercial activity, uh, where the vehicles are quite slow, but they have lots of ridership. And employment density, it's long been known that urban density is a driver of ridership and transit, but employment density really affects uh, transit. And lastly, integrated ticketing. Yeah, integration of light rail into the rest of the transit system is critical to its success, which is what the French have found. And this is why I'm going to spend some time on the French Nouveau Tramway movement, because it's been very influential in driving success in France. Um, and we think it's a bit of a model for the rest of the world and in the United States Transportation Research Board, we have spent quite a lot of time trying to understand. We've workshopped over many years. Our committee includes many members from France, and they've been able to help us monitor and understand why and how they have achieved good standards in light rail. Well, um, really, the largest development in the last 30 years uh, has been in France. 
And indeed, uh, although the United States has grown immensely, France has grown far in excess beyond us. There are some of the systems a lot more has developed since this graphic was done. This development, interestingly, occurred during the global financial crisis, during periods you wouldn't expect to see these happen. And we did a lot of work and had a workshop about trying to understand how they achieved uh, success. And I'm going to talk about a series of macro design issues of how they design these systems and micro design principles they've used to uh, achieve success. At a macro level, firstly, what they do is they look at their settlement patterns, they look at their trip attractors, the trip generators, and they use a core of light rail to provide excellent access to it and then integrate within a wider network to, uh, to get people to and from the light railway. Another key principle is that the vehicles are extremely large but very, very accessible. For that you need lots of light, you need big windows, you need airy and uh, cheerful designs, modern. You need um, long vehicles with high capacity, you need a ticketing system where you can get on and off the vehicle easily without having to queue. Um, and this is part of the principle, it's easy to get on and off, it's a pleasure to drive in them. A key principle is fully accessible stops at everywhere integrated within the street structures at a high quality. I hope you can see from these pictures that the infrastructure, the paving, all the fittings are of really the best standard and make, make the whole environment look very quality environment. The stops, uh, tram stops are adjacent to major destinations and when you get there the pedestrian access ways to and from those desti destinations have priority over everything else because this is a statement about what's important about light rail and the passengers is that the car is second placed and the environment and the passengers and the vehicle light rail vehicles have pride of place they have the first access another key principle is if you want to transform your city with light rail not everybody can have a light rail down their street so you need to access, be able to access it easily and quickly. And this is actually a bus uh, interchange point with the light rail vehicle with cross platform transfers. Coordinated to always be on time, coordinated to make it the walk easy. There is no fare supplement. We have integrated fares as I talked about before. It really is a point of making the whole system work together. Let's look at some of the micro design principles. Here is a street in a French town. What we see firstly is there's that this is actually where two light rail lines intersect at right angles. Uh, one of the light rail vehicles running east west you can see at the top and the other is north south with no vehicles on it at the moment. Firstly look at this street it is of a very high quality design. The paving is you know beautiful and another key point to mention is that the light rail vehicle and the pedestrians going to and from the stops have the right of way over all other vehicles. Car access is possible, but it is of a low quality and it has to wait for everything else. They can get on the tracks, but they are not allowed to stay there. Um, it really is an example of where the priority always is to light rail and its passengers. Um, and then the des urban design features are just, you know, quite high standard. Another real truth is that is what we call the art of insertion. This is where we take a, a street and we insert a light railway into it to, to create and transform the street into a place that people would like to be of a high quality and to improve the street's environmental characteristics to make it quite a beautiful place. Here is a traffic, uh, traffic sewer really, we call them with lots of traffic in a major street in Strasbourg before we had light railways. That street which was a very poor quality, very low demand of uh, people wanting to go and shop there was transformed into the largest shopping thoroughfare in the town uh, by making it pedestrianised, taking the traffic out, making sure the light rail provided access to all. Here's another street in Strasbourg. Previously it was dominated by cars. It was really quite an awful place. Lots of traffic, lots of pollution. 
Um, very little trade occurred because, you know, it was dominated by cars. And it was changed afterwards into being quite a beautiful street where car access was possible, but only at very slow speeds. And in fact, if you look carefully, you can see the park characteristics of this street have been emphasised. It's really quite a beautiful place to be. Here is another street. Uh, in fact, this is a plaza, a very famous one now, actually. Beforehand, on the left, it was really a traffic thoroughfare. It was dominated by traffic. Anybody who wanted to be there had to cross large roads, which were intimidating because of the traffic. There was a small element of greenery, but no one went there because of all the traffic. Afterwards, the traffic was downgraded. Access ways, if you look carefully on the right, you can see there is a underground access to a car park. Traffic access is possible, but in fact, it is very low quality. The area is dominated by trams. It's dominated by pedestrian access at a high quality. Now, in another event at the US Transportation Research Board, um, myself and a few colleagues worked with industry in France to try and understand why France had achieved all of these things um, um, and compare them to the United States. And we found what we call 10 drivers of success. Um, firstly, just have a look at some of these photographs. They are, they are French light railways. Aren't they quite beautiful? They're very colourful. They stand out. They are in beautiful areas of the city, which is all about making the city a more beautiful place. The 10 items we think created their success were leadership, funding, urban form, their culture to, to the pub, private car, planning, expertise, um, culture of the development of uh, the city, flexible design, integration, and an issue to do with utilities. Firstly, leadership. Now, in France, uh, a lot of the development is about mayors of the town. These are the local leaders of the town. It happens that in the, in the United States, our mayors of towns uh, tend to only last for two to three years, four years at maximum. This means, uh, given the construction of a light railway period, which is usually two to three years, sometimes four, um, it means that they cannot be elected into office, build a system, and then take credit for those systems because their term of office is finished before that has happened. In France, the mayors have a six year term, which means that they can um, go to an election they can go to the voters and say, I am going to build a light rail system. Um, and if you elect me, that will what will happen. That mayor can then do that and then get credit for having done that at the next election. It's a very important small point. But in addition, and I might add, there is the opening of the Reims tramway. Would you think that was popular? I think you'll see that people, all the people in that town are extremely for that. And that mayor was a very popular person when they delivered. And also they have an obligation to deliver that service once they've campaigned on it. And of course, they'll be elected out if they didn't. The problem in the United States is that they can't either take credit for it, uh, for those systems, or maybe even somebody else takes credit for it. Another very important issue is funding. The French have something called the Versement Transport. And this is a payroll tax, which is levied on companies and the, employ, uh, the employer's wages, a small percent of it is a tax that goes to transport. Now, uh, this has become one of the most important funding sources in France. But what's interesting is a mayor of a town can go to the election and say, I will build a light railway. And as part of that, I will levy a 1% payroll tax to fund it. So if you elect me, you agree to have this charge. I will then have the funding to deliver the system. It means it's not only possible electorally, it's also possible financially. Another key feature is the size of the light rail systems in all of these uh, towns and the size of the towns themselves. French towns and cities are quite compact and high density. Here's an example between Reims in France and Little Rock in the United States, both cities of the same population size. They're about 190,000 population. But as you can see from the map, they're well, both written to scale. Uh, you can see one is much more dense than the other. Little Rock is very well spread out. There's another feature of the light rail in these cities, which is very interesting, is the maps both show the light rail uh, systems 
in those, those cities. And you can see it in France. There's, there's the light rail alignment there. And in fact, it also shows it in Little Rock. But you can hardly see it. It's there. Can you see it? It's just very small there. Now, I hope you can realise that that system in France fundamentally penetrates and is part of the city. Uh, in Little Rock, it's too small. No one will really notice it. And this is a problem of urban density and design. Now, true, the Little Rock system is small and the uh, French system is much larger, but its effect on the area is much greater. And this really helps light railways, more condensed areas. Another very important thing is that the attitude to the car in France is extremely less sympathetic to the car. Uh, not only is car ownership lower in France, here's some data from the OECD, there's French car ownership per head of population. It, you know, it's, it's, it's substantially higher in the United States. But not only is it, it, it lower, but the way they plan the city for cars is substantially different. In the United States, cars dominate. Most voters drive, therefore it's very hard to do much about the car. But this is an interesting picture here. I took this picture in Reims. This is a bridge into the city centre and it is the only way that a car can get into the city centre from the biggest part of the city. And this is the access way. In fact, you can actually see some cars in this access way. And you might think from this large picture, well, where are they? they you can't see them. Well, the, they can't drive on this area because that's for the light railway. But they're allowed in this direction to drive on this little road here. But the bus has actually priority. And the bus can actually stop and let people on and board people. And all of the cars are sitting behind the bus and they have to wait. This is a statement. It tells the people who drive, yeah, you can go to the city, but you're going to have to wait for everybody else who's on public transport. And in fact, here's another picture of Angers. Uh, this is a before and after picture. Uh, before, Angers was dominated by cars. Cars were in every street. They were illegally parking. They were destroying the area. After the lack was put in, they were banned. And uh, you can see all the signs. And the street became very beautiful and very popular. Also, the, uh, the development and regulation of planning in France has some approaches which really favour public transport planning and being pro-development of new systems. They have a Air Quality Acts federally, which mandate at the local level that there are plans uh, which are required to help you meet those um, requirements, which means that there's a pressure on local governments and cities to actually do something about that. They have to come up with solutions and they have to have talked to the people. And if they don't get, get solutions, then they are mandated to go ahead and do that. This means that we are allowed to have consultations, but the people that try to stop it because they want more car access don't have a lot of power because really it's about having more sustainable options. Another important feature of France and um, if you're involved in light rail development around the world, the French really dominate. Uh, and this is for good reason, because they've concentrated their expertise in how to design and operate these things into some sep separate companies, which have done very well around the world. It's quite a, a beautiful thing to see uh, their expertise. Sistra, uh, the operator of the French railway systems, Veolia, Transdev, Keolis, uh, all very famous companies around the world now. Uh, and what happens is that government tends to work with these companies. Indeed, uh, for some of these larger operators, local government is actually part of those companies. Now, a very important part of light rail is to understand that it's not just, it's not just about transport. These vehicles and what they do can transform the urban development into a city, into a city that's very beautiful and sustainable. Have a look at some of these pictures here. This, these are all very beautiful French towns with very ancient environments. And what you see is some very modern vehicles in those ancient environments, sympathetically working with them to make those environments events even more attractive. Uh, we have Reims on the left here. Um, there's its cathedral, a very world famous cathedral. And the system really ena enables more pedestrianization. Reims is also the French capital of Champagne around the world, where Champagne was first produced. 
And look at the light rail vehicle. The very front of the vehicle has a design which looks just like a, a wine glass. Why? Well, because they want the people in that town to recognise the system as being theirs, as being unique to them, as em emphasising all the things they think are great in their town. In the middle is another beautiful system. You know, a lot of engineers would have looked at this right of way, which is segregated from cars, and cut down the trees because they're obviously going to get in the way of the overhead wires, or, and really had ballasted track. Uh, all very practical things, but what that would have missed was that the trees are beautiful and that the grass is beautiful and that uh, what they're trying to do is create the urban environment which is very attractive for passengers to use. And on the other picture again we see another example of a pedestrianised area with very high quality pavements uh, really improving the design. Another aspect of this design is uh, here's another part of uh, Reims. I took this photograph myself. This was a street which was a thoroughfare from uh, th throughout the, through the town and it used to be completely covered in traffic and these buildings were all dilapidated and run down. Um, when they put the tramway in they transformed the street into virtually a field uh, with trees and it's very beautiful now and if you look very carefully you'll see the buildings are all new and are being refurbished because the land value has rocketed, has really improved and the owners of that land have made money and it is really a great example of success. Car traffic is still possible but as you see it's one way single road access and um, there's another example here of Anjou. Effectively a car park beforehand was transformed into an area where children could play um, and where access was easy. Another key part of the story of French light railways is the vehicles. Uh, this is what I call mass customization. Mass customization is that you can produce vehicles in on mass and, reduce, and uh, reduce the unit costs, but they have customization available to individual towns to get designs which they uh, consider unique to their own. And this is often from just literally changing the front of the vehicle. <coughs> Not a very expensive thing to do. And lastly, there's been some innovations in France, grass tracks I've talked to you about now. A lot of expertise of how to do this in many environments, including uh, challenging tropical type environments now. Uh, overhead wires, uh, which have been removed in central areas. We have lots of solutions to this ground power batteries. And tram train is a very European issue. It's the idea of running this light rail vehicle on the street, but also on major thoroughfares where higher speed trains operate. Two last things from France. Firstly is integration. This is again um, Reims. Here we see the major thoroughfare east-west with trams in it only. And no traffic allowed. Um, this is the major street. And north-south we have buses. Uh, a very, uh, they're one of the first things they did in Reims when they built the uh, light railway was to redesign the bus system to make it efficient, access to and from the trams and integrate its fares. So you only had one ticket. One issue to mention about light railways, which the French have sorted out, I don't know if it's an issue in Korea, but when you build a new light railway, the utilities under the ground, this is water, gas, electricity, they have to be moved from under the tracks. Now this is very expensive, uh, relocating utilities. Uh, the reason you have to do that is because if you get a pipe burst or you need to change any of the utilities, you'd have to dig up the tracks, which would stop the tramway. Uh, and that's just not very efficient. Now what they do in, um, in um, these cases is they move all the utilities. That's expensive. It can be up to 15% of the total project costs. In this picture here is a picture of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. When they were designing and building the system, uh, they found a lot of problems with utilities under the ground. And because they were a little naive, I think, in writing the contract, it became clear that no one knew whose responsibility that was. And for a long period, that whole project was put on hold. This happened again in Sydney recently. Um, and it's important to, be to know who's responsible. Well, one of the amazing features of French light railways is there's an agreement with the utilities that any relocation of utilities is at the expense of the utilities. So they have to do that as part of developing new systems. So all that expense is taken away from the project. It becomes quite clear who's responsible. I'm going to close by 
talking about some of these new developments, not just in technology, but also in planning around the world. This is a great development in the United States in Portland, Oregon. This is a very advanced city. Um, it's an old industrial city where they have a quite a big light rail system, which fundamentally is operating in a separate right of way. They do have a separate streetcar system as well, very innovative. This is a bridge called the Tillicum Crossing, and they built a brand new bridge from the suburbs with high demand into the city center. But the bridge was only designed so that uh, light rail vehicles could use it. You can walk across it and you can cycle across it, but there is no access to the city on that bridge for cars. It was a big statement about what the future is. It's a very positive project and have really improved the travel time for a new light railway into the city and give it priority access, if you like. Around the world, of course, there's lots of developments in technology going on. And a lot of people think these are compete, compet competition to uh, public transport systems. But I think that's a, that's a wrong way to think because Uber, uh, these sort of uh, transport network companies are very easy to use. They're very user friendly. And here's an example in Dallas in the United States, the Dallas area rapid transit system, light railway, where they, they partnered with Uber on their smart card ticketing system, uh, where you could actually take an Uber using your smart card and you could um, use the same ticket for the tram. In Germany, uh, a lot of the transit operators run their own car share schemes where they have car clubs where you can go and use a car. Now that sounds the opposite if you like public transport cars, but in fact it's not that that's not the way it works. If you understand how car share schemes work, you'll find that most of the users of car share schemes are public transport users. And the reason is that if you use public transport a lot and you, you will not own a car, which means occasionally you may need a car. So the logic is quite clear there. Also they, where they have the car share pickup depots is all next to transit systems. So people can get to and from the car share scheme. And often you need a car to go out of town or to go long distances. I want to just um, talk a little bit about the design revolution going on in the Netherlands. This is one of the biggest stations in the Netherlands, Den Haag station. Uh, and it's been redeveloped. In fact, all of the major railway stations in the Netherlands have been redeveloped to become like cathedrals, like beautiful uh, statements of quality of light, of beautiful places to be. If we want our population to use public transport, we need to make it beautiful. And here we have the long distance uh, heavy rail by NS Rail at the bottom. And we have the light rail vehicle that goes into the town right next to the area. And it's given a beautiful access way into the station. And we have uh, transfers downstairs and on escalators. Another feature affecting the world of, of transport is driverless vehicles. And um, in fact, uh, what is, is not well understood is that driverless public transport vehicles dominate the land passenger driverless uh, technology in the world. This is the Docklands Light Railway. There's the front of the vehicle. Uh, it is, has no driver and hasn't had since it's operated. Very efficient system, was doubled in size during the 2012 Olympic Games. Um, and it's a, a technology option which we could all look for. They do have a, a, a conductor on the train to help passengers if they need to. Perhaps the biggest revolution going on in light railways is to do with power. And here are three solutions for catenary free uh, uh, access where you don't have to all, all the wires on top. You can either have ground power, which is now turning into a very reliable option. You can have boxes uh, for short distance batteries uh, on the on the roof. And also supercapacitors is a new technology, which is proving to be really quite reliable now. Um, this is Nice, France, where they have a traction uh, battery power. It's becoming very common now to use regenerative braking to create power into systems. And there's some uh, benefits and issues to do with those designs. Batteries are heavy and there's an issue and they can take up space in the car in the car for pa from passengers. Um, this is the Leon battery in Nanjing. I've traveled on this uh, just last year. Um, this uses prime move batteries, entirely battery driven system. Very reliable. It's next to their conference center. Um, the technology is very new, but it's actually proving to be quite effective. 
the substations are a bit noisy to my mind when I was there. And it does get a bit warm in those substations. Um, here's some sub supercapacitor systems again in Guangzhou. Uh, char they go for about four kilometers. They need charging at, after four kilometers. It just takes 10 to 30 seconds. And that's well within the range of dwell times typically. I did want to close by emphasizing something to you. Um, often when you're developing new light rail systems, you might not think this is important, but really you're at a stage now when you have to really think about this. And the issue is safety. You see these vehicles can run very fast, they accelerate very fast, um, and they weigh, you know, 50 tons plus, and you're putting them into streets where lots of people are going to be active. This is a safety concern. I want to show you this picture. This is from uh, Suzhou, China. I was given this by uh, someone in the operating company. Uh, what it shows is a very unpleasant thing. Uh, look at the context of the street. It's raining. It's dark. Um, people have got their their um, they've got their raincoats on. Um, they've got their hoods up. They've got an umbrella up. You know they weren't thinking. Yet the design enabled them to do that. Now. Um, you're going to be designing light rail systems in these environments and you need to think about that. You need to think about what could happen. There are some new technology developments. Increasingly, autonomous vehicle designs are being used to help uh, give the driver access to information. The trouble is our vehicles are getting bigger and bigger in light rail, um, but the driver is still the, the man in control or the woman in control. And the problem is that they can't perceive the entire vehicle and the new technologies can help them. I would urge any of you planning light rail systems to do something which is very useful. I think you should go and try and drive one of these vehicles because you get to understand what it's like to do that. The drivers only have one dimension of control. They can either stop or they can go ahead. So their concern with safety is directly in front of them all the time. They're trying to anticipate who in front of them is going to get in front of the vehicle and whether they should stop. One of the great concerns of the new vehicles, a heavier, larger mass, more speed, is that um, particularly on new systems, when people uh, are not used to them, particularly older people, they just enter the vehicle and they don't think about their vehicle stopping. But if the vehicle has to stop, they can stop really quickly and it can call fall, cause falls on trams. And this is something you need to think about, training the workforce, training the, pop, the population about the problems of driving around trams, about walking in front of trams. They could be quite uh, quiet vehicles, about uh, driving around them and cycling and about being within them. If you're going to develop these systems, I strongly recommend that you train your public about safety uh, and that you'll be doing yourself a favour. OK, that's it from me. My name is Graham Curry. I chair the Light Rail Transit Systems Committee at the US Transportation Research Board. This committee is a multinational committee. It is uh, many of the best operators around the world are on it and people in the industry and academics. We're working to try and create the best out of light rail systems. And you, my friends from Korea, are very welcome to be part of this. We have friends of the committee who can join up for free. Uh, our website is trblightrail.org. Uh, or you can contact me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And we have a meeting every year uh, where we look at the best in light rail and we talk about good practices and present papers on that information. Also, uh, I am a professor uh, of public transport funded by industry. Um, I run a group called the Public Transport Research Group. We've been independently assessed as top three in the world in research on the public transport field. Our website is ptrg.info and you're welcome to go there and see the types of projects we're going. We have about 100 odd researchers in the group. Uh, working on projects around the world. In addition, if you're interested in public transport and public transport research, my group, the Public Transport Research Group, runs a podcast series called Researching Transit. This uh, interviews the leading researchers in the world 
about what's happening in their industry. Um, that is available on iTunes and any of the usual uh, form, um, downloads uh, systems and platforms for podcasts. It's free to use. Lastly, uh, as a contribution to the world public transport industry, the Public Transport Research Group has created a database called the World Transit Research Clearinghouse. It's free to use. All the published research in the world is on this database. And uh, if you look, uh, you can search for anything you're interested in, like rail, you know, bogey design, all the different things that you might be interested in, urban development. And also, if there's a, 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 an area here, you can enter your email. And every uh, two, uh, every month or so, we will aim, uh, email you the latest publications in the field. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll be delighted to talk to you and interact with you about light rail futures for Korea. Thank you very much.